Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming to, uh, I think it's the 15th uh, Woodstock Film Festival Films and Conversations online. We have been doing that ever since basically mid-March when we had to close our office and we had all kind of really great directors and producers and screenwriters and actors, um, usually every Thursday, sometimes every Tuesdays and Thursday. And um, this time uh, we have a very special program for you. I'm really excited about it. So um, years ago, we were supposed to open the festival with a film called Married Life and then um, something happened and it was pulled off from the program and we ended up uh, opening in instead with the film Lars and the Real Girl, which we had a conversation about um, a few weeks ago with the uh, producer and with the composer. And so fast forward a few weeks and a few years, and now we can have you guys see Married Life. I hope you all saw it online recently or a while ago. And we have a director and producer and screenwriter uh, with us to talk about the making of the film and the collaboration and uh, just everything else that they're all working on right now. So welcome again. And I just want you to know that during the conversation, please write in your questions in the Q&A section. I will try to get to as many as possible. And now without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome director R.S. Sachs, or uh, screenwriter Oren Moverman, and producer Bill Horberg. Guys, why don't you join me? Oh, here they all are. Ira, I'm still not it's seeing you. Video? <laughs> I was unable to start. Why is that? I don't know. Um, I am going to ask our... There we go. Uh, oh, here you uh, are. Here you are. Hello, everybody. Hello. So, um, um, help me welcome uh, three very talented and very prolific individuals in the film industry. Um, Bill Horberg is, um, has produced some of the best films in the past few decades, and he's currently also the uh, president of the Screen uh, of the Producers Guild East. So, hello, Bill. Nice yeah. to welcome you here. Hi. Oren, thanks for having me. Oren Moverman is screenwriter, producer, director. I first met o o Oren when we opened the festival with his directorial debut, uh, Messenger, which then went on to be nominated for an Academy Award. An extremely strong film. Uh, Oren is a very sought after everything, producer, screenwriter, uh, director, and a very busy guy. So I'm glad you have time to be with us. Hi, Oren. Hi, it's my pleasure to be here. And Ira, <laughs> Ira, you shot a film here. Um, do you remember? Uh, I think it must have been almost a decade ago that you shot um, uh, the title Light. Oh my God. Keep the lights, keep the lights on. That's right. You saw it, I think, about a week upstate. I can't see yes. you guys on set. Yes. Uh, Ira is a wonderful director. Um, so lucky to have you. And um, thank you for having me. And thank you for pulling this group together. Four Jews and are not in a room talking. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. We're not well. arguing yet. <laughs> yet. Yet, yet is a good. Um, is an important uh, word. So you guys, and some of you have been seeing each other um, pretty often. Some of you have not seen each other for a year or two. Can you talk a little bit about um, what brought you all together to um, create a married life? Start with our yes. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I, what, what was interesting for me about this film is that it was, it ended up so far being my biggest production. It was the biggest budget. It had movie stars. And in some ways, I think it was interpreted as, as some sort of um, different kind of work in, in, in terms of what I had made. But it actually began sort of where everything else did for me. And it, and it continued to be, and I watched it uh, yesterday and, and I felt it still is an extremely personal film for me. It's a very, it's a kind of personal filmmaking that is, was done on a different level than I had done before in terms of the, the budget and in terms of, 
uh, some other things, but it came from a place that was very um, close to my heart. I started writing the film in the kind of early 2000s, um, and it it was sort of a combination of my own story of living in a in a uh, in an intimate relationship in which there were a lot of secrets, and also my my grandparents story um, who had grown up, I had grown up in Memphis in the, in the 1960s and sort of knowing little tales about their lives in the 40s and the 50s and the ways in which couples were, were complicatedly connected was where the, the film began. Um, so luckily at some point I met Oren. Um, we were compared to each other because we were both balding and and Jewish, and we were both in the film industry. And at one point he was working on a film called um, Jesus' Son, and someone came up to me to compliment me on the script. And I used that as an opportunity to introduce myself to Oren, and we became friends, and eventually we became collaborators. So um, he can tell you a bit about, about how we started working on this. Yeah, I was I was told. I mean, I had the same experience. People would uh, talk to me, and I called me Ira. And I, I I haven't met Ira at that point, and I thought it was vaguely anti-Semitic and probably very <laughs> insulting to Ira. Uh, but uh, then I heard, I think it was from our friend Jonathan Nosseter, um, mm -hmm. that Ira would like to meet me, and I really thought we were meeting because uh, we we had to put this thing to rest. We have to start kind of reclaiming our names and our uh, images. And he, um, you know, we, we, it was a friendly meeting. We just talked. And then he said, there's a script that he's been working on called Marriage. It was called Marriage at the time, I believe. And uh, that he wanted me to read it and see if I wanted to uh, contribute to it. And I, to tell you the truth, I was kind of overwhelmed because Ira is an accomplished screenwriter and uh, director, obviously, and someone who had more experience than me at that time. And um, I felt really... Um, honored to be kind of uh, invited to go on this trip with him because I knew it was personal. I also knew it was a book he found, uh, Five Roundabouts to Heaven, and, uh, and saw a way in. And he, to be honest, he gave me a draft uh, that I thought was quite um, advanced. And so uh, my role was just to try to figure out the things that he wanted to fill in and to, for me to contribute to the, the process. Um, well, and, and what, for what me, still come in. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I met both of these guys. I would say, uh, in some way, through Sidney Pollack. Uh, you know, I worked for Pollock for many years after I left uh, Paramount as an executive. Uh, my colleague at the company, Mirage, uh, is a wonderful producer and executive. Now he's working for Showtime. A man named Jeff Steer. Uh, and he had been a very early uh, champion of Ira. He saw his film, The Delta, uh, really loved it, uh, brought Ira to uh, our company's attention um, and brought in a project uh, that uh, Mirage ended up uh, producing with Ira and his partner uh, called 40 Shades of Blue, uh, which is a very personal and, and Memphis set and Memphis shot uh, movie. Um, so, you know, that history was there and I, I already knew Ira, I was a fan of his work. Uh, and <clears throat> when this project, uh, Marriage, came to me, I had just started uh, running a company for Sidney Kimmel, who uh, mm -hmm. is a billionaire and uh, uh, a remarkable man. He's still alive. He's in his 90s. He is a major philanthropist and uh, cancer research uh, supporter. Uh, and he had he had just started a film company in the early 2000s uh, to produce a slate of independent films. Um, and Jeff, uh, at that time, was going to be the producer on Marriage. Uh, and he submitted the script to me. And um, I've always uh, had a soft spot for noir uh, films and stories. As you can see, I have a big collection of old paperbacks behind me that I've had. So uh, probably five roundabouts is somewhere uh, in that, that pile. Um, and this was just a, a page turner. You know, it was a wonderful piece of sophisticated uh, writing uh, about human relationships and frailty and infidelity and 
uh, commitment and uh, it constantly surprised and delighted me. Uh, so I moved as a kind of studio head uh, to try to get in business uh, with these two guys that I uh, already knew their work. Uh, there's kind of an apocryphal story, I guess it's true, but Warren can confirm it that uh, Oren met Pollock because uh, he had the chutzpah to uh, walk up to him in a, a bagel store uh, in uh, New York near where Pollock lived and recognized him and somehow bent his ear and got him to read uh, one of his screenplays. And so Pollock came back to the company and said, yeah, this guy kind of accosted me as I was getting my cream cheese and uh, <laughs> I read this script and I think it's good and he's somebody we should be aware of. So, you know, they were both on my radar screen as people that I wanted to work with already. I was already a fan of Ira's and uh, it was exactly the kind of uh, size movie that we were looking to uh, back. Uh, Kimmel read the script right away and he loved it. You know, it really uh, uh, caught his fancy. Uh, I don't remember who was attached at that time. There were some actors circling around it, but once we got into business together, you know, the, the whole cast really came together uh, mm -hmm. amazingly. I mean, those four actors, oh my God. Who, who brought on board the, the cast? Do you remember? <clears throat> I mean, very strong cast. Um, well, <clears throat> you know, I work with A.V. Kaufman in New York and uh, he's a great casting director and we've worked for a long time together. So I, I'm sure um, AV was, was a conduit, as was Jeff, and eventually Alex Madigan ended up producing the film also. And um, so I'm trying to remember how we got to these various people. You know, Rachel McAdams, the only thing I, I sometimes say my, my, because I think she's a, such a wonderful actress, and I think she's so touching in this film. Um, and she's so good, continued to be so good. I think she's, um, uh, she had given up acting for a couple of years at this point. She, she had had an early success of which, I, don't, I mean, I guess The Notebook maybe was before this. Or me, me. And, and she had sort of not sure it was for her. And I, and I ended up um, meeting her and we had a lot of conversation. And I, and I, I, I feel that she trusted me to, to get back into the business. And we had a really nice time working on the film. And Patty Clarkson, I knew... Um, because we had both, I had been an undergraduate at Yale when she was in graduate school at Yale. Um, and, uh, and Chris, I, I didn't know, but really Adaptation was, was a film where I just saw him be, to be able to be such a transparent and such a, you know, a live kind of actor. So it's, it seemed you wanted someone sympathetic in that role and he was that. And then there was Pierce who I think is actually great in the film, not, and, and was wonderful to work with until we were editing and then he was less wonderful, but in the spot. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I wanna go into that. You can go if you want to, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to get into some questions from our um, virtual audience members. Um, and it's interesting because I have questions from two film editors who I'm sure you know. Michael um, and Sabine. <laughs> correct. <laughs> Uh, so Michael Taylor is asking, or he's saying first, I rewatched the film recently and was struck by the use of first person narration in the film. Was this an original part of the screenplay? I may be missing something, but I don't recall first person narration being used much in Oren or Ira's past work. Mm. So you wanna address um, that? That was there from the beginning. I think Ira was, was first uh, approaching it as a, as a first person narration. Uh, even though Pierce, Pierce's role, um, you know, he, Richard was, was not classically the leading role in it. Uh, he definitely assumed that position in the voiceover. And uh -huh. the voiceover has a long history um, because there was, you know, that was something that we kept on working on. And I remember going into the editing room and talking there were very meticulous conversations as we, you know, kind of rewatched the film as it was being edited, tested it, uh, and it kept evolving and it kept getting to a place where it finally locked in. And I, I, I was watching the film last night as well because I, I'm old and I can't remember anything. And uh, and I, I was I was struck that the voiceover is actually kind of experimental in a way. It's it's really 
assuming every type of voiceover you can imagine. It's first person, but it's also in the moment in some places. It's, it's also in a way watching the film and commenting on, it was sort of a commentary track by the character. Uh, and then it's sometimes it doubles the action. It really is very playful. And that's one of the things I love about the movie. And I think for me, it was a way um, from the writing stage. There, there is a really great book called Five Roundabouts to Heaven, which Oren and Bill mentioned, which is, which is a really good period thriller. And I had been watching a lot of 40s movies before this and sort of seeing within them domestic melodrama, like noir as domestic melodrama. And, and that was part of my interest in, in, in putting these things together. And I, and, and I do think there was a good amount of the... Um, voiceover came from from the text. I mean, there was a, there was a certain language and a way of speaking. Um, though I think eventually Oren and I were able to kind of mimic that that voice in some ways, the period voice. So so there was that work, and and then really what Oren is talking about when about coming into the editing room is that there was in the script that we ended up making, um, there was a bookend to the film that process, and that was a. You know, we, that was a very arduous experience. When I watched the film yesterday, I thought it was the right choice. I have to say, um, I, I didn't, I didn't regret it, and I and I felt it was the right choice at the time, and I was never forced to to make it. But the film had many, many endings, including one in which Pierce Brosnan um, is actually on the stand uh, in a in a in a trial for the murder of his friend Harry, um, who he helped kill at a certain point. I do not remember how, to be honest, <laughs> but there was a whole thing where the whole thing was told as if the, we learn at the end that it was told from the standpoint of someone defending their life on a jury stand uh, in a court trial. And that got cut. And because of that, the voiceover, there was some, there was some massaging that we needed to do, which I have to say when I watched yesterday, I didn't remember nor notice. So I think we did a, we did a good job pulling it together as a whole organic piece. Almost every one of my films seems, and Michael Taylor can speak to this, uh, who was the editor, uh, one of the editors on, on Love is Strange. Um, I've often seemed to have two or three or four endings and often one or two of them get cut in, in the editing. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a cliche to say a film gets written three times, you know, when you write it and then when you shoot it with the camera and then in post but this film more than almost any that i worked on i mean ripley had a uh, a, a large transformation in post uh, but this was kind of a fascinating uh souffle you know and uh as iris said it you know it had these kind of noir plot elements uh, it definitely had uh, i mean we love douglas sirk and you know, we kind of talked about his movies. I remember you showed me this movie, Pandora and the Flying Dutchman or something that you were yes. a big fan of. Yeah, and, uh, um, but it also had this uh, wit to it, you know, and it it was a kind of Hitchcockian mordant wit, I would say. Uh, and that was in the script. Um, and it certainly was in the filming and in some way, I thought Pierce was so good in terms of the uh, playing every uh, piece of the humor that was inherent in the material. Uh, and he really yeah. just brought that out. You know, it's so perverse, the situations he finds himself in because he's very privileged to have all the information that other characters don't have. Uh, and he's using that in a very manipulative and selfish way. Uh, but it was very, very funny. Uh, and so from that very first screening, you know, we kind of suddenly saw that this film had taken on a life of its own in the making of it and was in fact plain funnier than mm -hmm. certainly I thought when I first read the script and when uh, as a company we went out to sell it. We really mm -hmm. sold it as a kind of classic, uh, you know, uh, noir domestic uh, melodrama. Um, and yet we had something else on our hands. Uh, so it was the ending kind of, and the tone, which we really ended up in a, uh, I thought a kind of wonderfully exciting uh, post-production process. I mean, we, uh, Ira has an incredible editor 
uh, this guy Afonso uh, who cut it uh, and when the music came in and his composer was uh, this uh, British guy Dickin. Yeah, you know, I think for me, when, when I watch the movie, it's exactly what you're, we're discussing, which is the, the conflict between the melodrama and the suspense and the comedy, which makes it um, comedy, you know, the comic, I would say more than the comedy, is, right. is, a, is a genre mix. You know, when I watch it, if I, was, if I was, you know, going to approach it again, I think the whole thing should be faster, to be honest. And I think that's really this interesting um, tension between having made, um, really written a, a sort of melodrama that became a sort of comic film, is that in somehow the pace of the film, and, I, it, and it's not, it, I just, I guess it's also because I've been, I have watched a lot of the, the, I watched Shadow of a Doubt, you know, just the other day. So if you're looking at the, the Hitchcock version, I think in general this was something for me and I wonder, I wonder, Bill and Oren, if you feel this way. I feel like my whole life trajectory to try, as I try to get to, for, my, for me to be a better filmmaker is to try to get lighter. And that to get lighter is to get deeper. And I feel like in this movie, I was somewhere in the middle. I was not so light as a person mm. when I made this film. So the, so, and, and so I, I think that, um, that's something when you see the Hitchcock versions of these, there is an incredible lightness. I'm a big fan of getting heavier. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I, I watched it again last night and I was really kind of moved by it. And I also, I, I may disagree with you a little bit on, on the pacing because I find the pacing, there's something so reassuring about it and so much of the era not just the era, you know, 2008 or seven when we were making it, but uh, you know, the late forties. And mm -hmm. I love how it takes its time with details and, and, and how meticulously it's directed and the acting and how they're not in a rush to, to say what they have to say. It's, yeah. it, it belongs to a different era. And I think that that's one of the accomplishments of the movie that it, it actually does not try to be what it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not the same people now, but, but back then, it, you know, I think it was something led to it being, you know, a work that, that to me now speaks in, in even in new ways. One, one thing I did really feel is that all four performances are very, very touching. They are all extremely honest performance. Moments that are so tender, really, really tender. And I think that, um, that I wish, to be honest, that's what I wish, I wish the film had been seen by more people because I think they are, all have something so beautiful, really beautiful in what they give in the movie, all four of those actors. Um, you said before, um, you, you were talking about things that were <clears throat> edited, that were cut out uh, in the edit. Um, were those all your decisions or did it have something to do also with the distributor um, that came on board and had some, did they have any uh, creative decisions? No, there was no one exterior to, to the group of us. There was, there was an experience which I did and I've never done before, never done before and I've never done since, which is I had screenings in Pasadena. And that was, um, I mean, it seems that Hollywood directors do this all the time. To me, it was extremely arduous and not pleasant. And I hope never to do it again. Um, and it, it's a terrible experience. That being said, I'm someone who does screen my movies often to audiences, just not in Pasadena. And, and usually, and, and, and so there was that which was trying to assess the film was expensive enough that it, that it had commercial um, uh, needs, which I respected and, and, and I feel, um, uh, so, you know, Bill respected me as did Sidney Kimmel and the company. There was a lot of respect, but, but somehow the audience, um, we had to process, uh, that. And that was, I mean, I do think it was a hard film to figure out how to finish. I just think it was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was also, we, we, spent a lot of money shooting this ending, yeah. you know? So as a company, we had kind of bought into it and we thought this is the movie and we invested. There was a whole uh, uh, move in the story where it went 20 years further in the future. And there was a kind of 
leap forward in time, uh, and then uh, Cooper's character and uh, Clarkson's character get into a big car accident, which we shot and staged, and yeah. uh, and then uh, he's in the hospital. And oh, you remember, and, I forgot. All yeah, that. you know, yeah. Richard as his friend comes to see him in the hospital, uh, and so it, it kind of had a third act in a way of the fourth. Reverber the fourth fourth <laughs> act. Yeah, where the kind of reverberations of the movie that you guys all saw carried on. Uh, and then Richard ends up uh, killing Cooper's character, poisoning, poisoning him. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of a mercy uh, killing. Uh, but he ends up in the courtroom and trying to kind of explain to himself and to the judge and to the audience in a way these complicated motivations that you know led these best friends to this situation where you know the friend had killed the other friend bill i will tell you this now and i'm curious how this strikes you but when i talk about this movie i call it it was a bush era folly <laughs> because because it was pre-2008 and there was a period where people were spending money that they hadn't since spent you know, and, and, and by the way, when they spend it, they had it. As Bill uh, described Sydney from the very beginning, the first thing you said was he was a billionaire. So, you know, the movies were made. And, and so, but, but I do think that there was something about this that was the end of an era. Hopefully it wasn't the thing that, that killed the, the era, but, but, the, but it was the end of an era in which there was um, a lot of money in this country and, and for some reason it was going into films. And actually, I have to say to Bill's credit, the series of films they made at Kimmel are really an incredible bunch of movies. I mean, really like Synecdoche is a masterpiece, it's an incredible film. And, and, and so many of those films that you made were like rich in a way that, um, that the money actually was helped. It wasn't just a, a, it wasn't just too much money. It was a quality that, that, I, that I think was really wonderful that you led to make in that time. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, it, it certainly was a kind of a bubble uh, in the independent film world that uh, really got uh, burst, you know, with the financial collapse in 2008. And yeah. uh, it never really recovered, you know, I mean, uh, I just, as my example was always when we made um, Sense and Sensibility, which was a studio film, but it was a Taiwanese director who had never made an English language film. And, you know, it was certainly made for a price. But there was a world where you could make a Jane Austen movie uh, with Emma Thompson and it could go out and gross $40 million at the domestic, you know, box office and play on 1,200, 1,500 screens and uh, people yeah. would go out to see that kind of content theatrically. Uh, and that world has radically shrunk and, and radically changed, you know. And uh, I think the three of us are still, you know, trying to, uh, you know, make serious subjects and, you know, uh, sophisticated well, content for adults, but it's mostly migrated to television and, and streaming. Uh, platforms. Uh, Not for me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're still I mean, doing it. it. Well, as a form, I would say that's why I, the films that I'm watching for inspiration now are Chantal Ackerman and Frank Riplo and, and like independent back in the day where independent means independent. You get the money where you can and you make, you make those films and that there's something about that limited means, which does not limit the, limit the success of the film. So, you know, right. Well, and now there's a whole other factor that's going to define production and the content that can get made, yeah. you know, is yeah. uh, we're going to see another big change. I want to talk about that a little later in, um, in our conversation, because it is actually a very important subject that uh, I'd love for you guys to touch upon. But I want to get um, back to some of the questions from our audience. Uh, so I have something that's really more of a comment first, I'll start with, from Deborah Constable. And she's saying, she's just saying that the betrayal in the film reminded her of Pinter's uh, play Betrayal. And she elaborates on that and said, the betrayal not only is the mirage between the two men, I, she, she was very moved by Chris Cooper's work. And she thought that the three piece suit was very effective. So those are just comments that are nice comments. Mm -hmm. I thought I could share. 
And uh, now we have a question from Jen Price. And she's saying, uh, for some reason, this movie was under my radar. Um, I watched it last night and loved it. I love the opening credits and the music. Who was responsible to that? Who did that? Um, well, the credits were by this person, this kid who I'm still working with, who's not a kid anymore. He was literally a kid when he designed those credits. Um, his name is Ilya Abakov, and he um, had just uh, immigrated from Russia to the U.S., and he was like 19 or 18, and he worked for a title company um, that did like Spider-Man titles, but he, on his side, had this whole very magical way of thinking about things, and he submitted this as one of the 30 bids to do the opening titles, and 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 he's a genius. He's a really genius, and, and, and I've continued. He still does my titles. I love the guy, and... Um, and the music in the opening titles is a, is a 40s piece, and I can't remember. Um, um, I'll Give You Anything But Love? I think that's what it is. So, yeah. So it's a, it's a 40s piece. The, most of the music in the film, um, the score, there's a lot of period music, but the score is by a man named Dickon Hinchcliffe, who had done the music in 40 Shades of Blue, the film before this, and, and we have since done three films together. And he is in Bristol, England, and um, used to be in the band Tender Sticks and worked often with Claire Denis and with me, and, um, and he's a wonderful guy. And he did, he really, he's the one who taught me that Bernard Herrmann uh, learned everything he knew from Shostakovich. Oh, wow. And, and I think the depth of his understanding of this kind of music was really part of, of what works, as well as just the emotional element. Did you have a music supervisor also that helped you with the Song Sue, um, Sue Jacobs, the great Sue Jacobs. Oh, and great. and this was the first time I got to work with Susanna Perrick, who is the, the best music supervisor in the history of American cinema, I would say. Um, uh, has worked with me, but also with Polanski and Demi and and Spielberg and just and she's just a wonderfully sensitive um, person and and understood. I, I didn't know what a music editor could be, um, but she and uh, Sue Jacobs worked closely with me on the film. Um, I have a question here from Sabine Hoffman, who is an editor, but this is a question that is more of a, um, has a more general um, thing for, for it to, to all three of you. So it's for all of you. And she says, um, I love all of you so much and the amazing work that you do. Um, and I hope for many more from all of you. And I would love to hear, by the way, what you guys are working on now. But could you speak about decision making and how you collaborate, whether it's amongst yourself or with others? Uh, how do you solve disagreements when there are any? Um, do you support the creative process? What guides your solutions? I know that this is a very com these are complex questions, mm -hmm. and you don't and you can just pluck one particular part of her question for each one of you. Um, if you and if you'd like, I can read it again. So to because there are few parts to it. Um, I, I, can, I get it. Yeah. I mean, the key word, if I can jump in, the key word for me is process. process. You, commit, you commit to the process. You commit to collaboration. There's a lot of a lot of love in this group, but there's also you know individuals and creative minds, and I think there was a lot of respect, and we all listened to each other. I, I played a smaller role, obviously. But, um, but they were kind enough to, to bring me in and include me in the screenings in Pasadena and beyond. And it was always about getting together and sitting around the table and, and discussing things and, and get, coming up with, with solutions from what I remember. Yeah. You know, I think um, Oren and I are, you know, we're, we're brothers in a certain way. We're really, we, have, we met each other when we could not make films. We were, we were both hoping to make films. And so we grew up together in a certain way. That doesn't mean when we were 10 and 12, it meant <laughs> when we were like 30 and above. Um, but I think that there was always for, well, at least for me working with Oren, there's always a sense of humor uh, uh, about what we're doing and the stakes as well as the, the opportunity. So there's a pleasure in what we're doing that never gets lost. Like you know, you're lucky to be doing these things. And I think we, we share that together. For me as a director, um, who, so then I'm working with a producer and I'm working with a co-writer. 
Uh, I'm always trying to put them in a position where they have as much autonomy as possible. Ultimately, I know that if it's a good relationship, they, that I, they respect that I'll be able to make decisions, but you want them to do the things that they can do without you. I mean, that would be the case with Michael Taylor, an editor. You want to be able to leave the room and let them f fly. Yeah. And so I think that's something that for me is, is, is really central to, to what it is to collaborate. Um, to understand that people have talents that you do not have and to try to access those and inspire those. Right. I mean, it's all, uh, I, go ahead, Will. Yeah, I guess for me, um, you know, it's my whole life has really been a, a, in a way about the relationship with writers and uh, uh, directors and I am neither, you know, a, a writer or a director. Uh, and I, you know, come to it with a tremendous amount of respect. I mean, a writer starting with a blank page and having an idea and turning it into a story and characters and dialogue and bringing that to life. And then a director may be a writer-director, but sometimes not. And they're, uh, you know, taking someone else's work and interpreting it. Um, I did kind of cut my teeth uh, as a studio executive, you know, so I didn't go to film school. Uh, I wasn't really in the film business or trying to have a career in film. I, I had a movie theater in Chicago when I was young. Um, but I, because I worked at Paramount, I kind of certainly was schooled in the idea that the audience has final cut, you know, that uh, we're making content uh, and certainly, uh, you know, at this budget, uh, you know, to try to, uh, you know, capture the hearts and uh, minds uh, of, a, of an audience. And uh, so I was very used to the process, you know, that was uh, novel for Ira. Uh, you know, I'd been to a, a tremendous number of audience uh, screenings and, you know, learned how to not take what everybody said literally, but, you know, metaphorically in a way, you know, the knee bones connected to the thigh bone. And if there's right. a lot of people talking about something, <laughs> there's an issue there, you know, and so I, I, I'm always trying to like uh, make things as playable as they can be, as satisfying as they can be to the audience while kind of remaining true to their intentions. And uh, for me, I, Ira, you know, was very gracious and, you know, we spent a lot of time together before he shot. I went up to Vancouver, we had dinner, we talked through the script. I just wanted to really get inside what are your intentions with this scene, with this? How do you see it? How is it good? Because then, you know, I can kind of, uh, you know, maybe have an art, a creative argument. Well, I, I think that's confusing, or I think, you know, maybe people aren't going to understand that for X reason or Y, but it's all within a, a boundary of this is what this is. This is what it's trying to be. This is the best version of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're kind of swimming in the same direction. Uh, when you really get in trouble is when there's a lot of people who all w want something different out of it, you know, and then the, the process becomes unmanageable. And, you know, the person with the most power ends up, uh, you know, dictating in, in that system, you know, which is why a lot of filmmakers, you know, can't work in Hollywood, you know, or, or they can only work if they have the final cut uh, right contractually themselves, you know, so they're not subject to somebody, uh, you know, <clears throat> changing their work. I think it also helped that the three of us, we're all pretty literate, to be honest. Like we've all read a lot and I think we've all love movies. And so that was really something that was like from the first time I met Bill and certainly with Oren as well, there was just a love of the, of the, the medium that is really, like that's a really good base and that's not everyone. And, and not only a love, a knowledge. I would say the knowledge was also very um, connecting. It built trust. Okay, thank you. I have um, two questions for each one of you. Um, so one of them, and again, it's for the, uh, each one of you separately. Um, what are you working on next? Actually, you know what? I'm going to combine the two into one. Because what are you working on next or what are you working on now has a lot to do with what do you think is going to happen in the near and far future in terms of 
movie making as well as exhibition because the two are very connected. Uh, how we, when are we going to be able to make movies again? How are we going to be able to make them? And how are they going to be viewed? And I'm going to start with Bill, who is um, the person who's making things happen. Producer, uh, Bill, uh, you're on. Well, I, I shot two things last year. So most of this year I'm in post-production. Uh, one is a limited series uh, that is for Netflix. Uh, Scott Frank is the writer director. It's an adaptation of a wonderful novel by Walter Tevis who some of you might know from uh, his book, The Hustler, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Yeah. Um, so that's a seven part uh, limited series. It's gonna debut in October. Uh, we're deep into post, we're uh, close to locking the episodes. Uh, and then another film that I made uh, is directed by and starring uh, Sean Penn and his daughter, his real life daughter, Dylan Penn. Uh, it's a father-daughter story. It was based on a memoir. Um, that's also in post-production now. It's been a little more complicated because we shot on film and then our lab was in Canada. The lab closed down. Travel to Canada was suspended. So, you know, we've had a rocky road, uh, but we're just about to resume editing. Uh, that does not have uh, domestic distribution yet. So, um, you know, the original plan was to take it to the fall festivals. Uh, now, you know, we're, we're on plan B, C, or D. Um, in terms of what, you know, next and what's around the corner, a lot of smarter people than me are, you know, very, very actively engaged in um, negotiations uh, around all aspects of production. Uh, one of the fundamental ones is the whole issue of insurance. Um, you know, nobody's going to take on personal uh, risk. Uh, and if COVID is excluded from insurance, uh, it uh, <clears throat> becomes a real conundrum. Uh, you know, maybe the big studios could self-insure, but, you know, individual producers certainly cannot. Uh, I just read today that England uh, has created something like a 500 million pound fund that's going to be administered by the government and is going to allow for a insurance umbrella to exist, but just in England and for British production. Uh, the people I talk to here certainly think the government is going to have to be part of the solution that if the insurance companies, uh, you know, <clears throat> won't provide that coverage because of the level of risk uh, insuring against pandemic, uh, there'll have to be some government way that um, the liability is uh, protected. Uh, in terms of actually shooting, you know, there's a white paper the Academy just circulated. There's the Pro Producers Guild uh, working group, uh, but there's so many constituencies in terms of actors. You know, what are they going to need to feel uh, secure and safe to because they're unmasked and un unprotected uh, crew. Uh, so the whole issue of what are the protocols uh, that will allow for a safe uh, resumption of work. Uh, what's going to change? Is that going to be more stage bound work because it's more uh, controlled environment? Uh, international production has been a huge boom, but you know, are, is the same level of travel uh, possible? So there's all kinds of um, deep tectonic <laughs> shift conversations going on. Yeah. So. Oren, um, you want to put your producer's hat on? or Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. I, I think that we are at that stage where nobody knows everything and everyone's an expert. So I, I, I think there's a lot of thinking, there's a lot of talking. Um, there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainties. I, I'm married to an epidemiologist, so I, I have the CDC on the uh, on the special phone oh, in the in living room. room. Uh, <laughs> I, I know the, that, that really does, there's just a lot of question marks. So I, I, I know that what's important is safety. And as long as every, every conversation is driven by that, we, we may get to some interim solutions. Obviously a couple of years from now, we're in a different world, but the next uh, 
you know, year to two years uh, are going to be uh, an experiment as far as I'm concerned, and there are going to be a lot of changes. And obviously, we were also dealing with uh, independent film becoming something else right before COVID. And now it seems to be, um, I don't want to sound too dire, but it seems to be in trouble. Um, so, you know, I, I, to answer the question, what's, what am I doing? Uh, I did make the mistake, uh, even though Bill warned me, and I did start producing a few years ago. Um, you know, I, w I thought this year I was going to be directing more. That's really not happening, and so I'm spending my time writing. What are you writing? My uh, obituary. Oh my God, Yaron! Please, what are you writing? Um, I'm I'm working on uh, different things, feature films. I'm working for other directors. I was taught by great directors, how to work with other directors, people like Iris Axe, and uh, I've made that part of um, uh, my occupation. Uh, so I'm writing for other directors. I'm also writing for myself. Uh, I have a couple of scripts that I'm working on that I'm attached to direct and trying to cast it in a very uh, abstract way because there's no way to put a date in front of an actor, but there's a way to put a conversation in front of an actor. So mm -hmm. that's in progress. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're, the, uh, they're very lucky to be in the sort of pretend pilot um, mm -hmm. uh, business. And so there's, there's stuff being developed that may or may not happen. Do you have an interest in the um, series or are you strictly film, independent film? I have an interest in series only to the extent that it would be foolish not to. Um, my heart is with independent films, but, uh, you know, I, we're in the process of redefining what that, that means, you know? Right. I mean, you Ira? guys... Ira? Um, I, uh, you know, it's been an, it's been an interesting two and a half months, I'd say, since the, since the aliens landed, mm. uh, which is what I feel happened. And, I mean, it's kind of amazing that we're having ordinary conversations and while well, the whole world just shifted. And, and it reminds me of, of uh, a friend of mine just wrote a piece about, uh, a writer named Claire Massoud just wrote a piece about her grandparents and the letters they wrote to each other during the war in France. And it's quite beautiful to read her piece um, because they talked about what they wanted to be for their children and what joy they wanted to somehow express, even though Italy was about to be become an access member, become part of the access and, and was going to drop a border and they were trying to escape. And so it's important, I think, to have perspective on, on what is a terrible time. Let's say it. Um, I would say that in the first couple of uh, months of this, there was, a, for me, a lot of personal mourning because I, I'm working on a film um, with my next longtime co-writer, Mauricio Zacharias. We've written, we've made four films together, he and I, um, including Keep the Lights On, the film that you, you mentioned. And we're working on a film, which is, um, it's a very intimate film about love and desire and surprise. It's a, it's a film that has um, certainly has physical intimacy and it's, and it's a script we're getting more and more excited. The nice thing is we're getting more and more excited about it as we write it. And we're writing it for Saeed Ben Saeed, who's the producer who produced our last film, Frankie, and, and, uh, and I love the film. So that's, that's a really good feeling to hold on to because, and to have grown during this time, like it's more exciting to me now in some ways. So um, I'm working on that, but, but personally, I, I was supposed to, like, like Oren, I was supposed to make that film in the fall, and that's not gonna happen. And, and I am not an economic engine for, for cinema, so I don't even think about what Bill's talking about because I'm not gonna do that. Like, there's, there's no reason for me to create an environment where people are getting paid badly uh, in order to risk them getting a, a, a COVID or, or, so that's not gonna happen for me. So for me, it was, becoming, you know, 2022 is what I, in a long process, began to think about as, oh, well, let's hope. And that was then, uh, you know, what, what's been surprising and kind of wonderful for me is that I, for the first time in my life, started writing prose. I kept, I was jealous of my painter friends and my novelist friends and my poet friends. I was very jealous. 
because I felt I, I missed the meaning of creativity. I really, really missed it. Um, but I only sort of stumbled upon writing uh, about eight or nine days ago, and I'm really, it's, it's meaningful to me. It's, it's jo it is joyous. So, um, it's between six and seven in the morning before my kids start, uh, you know, distance learning. And it's, but, but I think that um, that is sort of like, for me, like, like the people in, in, in France, you have to figure out where joy can be found if you're lucky enough to have your health and a roof over your head, which is, which is a big if. So everything I'm saying is, out of, is from that perspective and, and that privilege. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's small silver linings. I would imagine many of us have, have experienced them in this time. That being said, there's a huge dark cloud over all of us. And for me, that cloud doesn't even, it doesn't even move. It just sits there. So that's, um, that's the truth. So um, I think films will be made and I look forward to, to being a part of that. Well, I want to end this on a positive note because between Oren and, and, and Ira, it was a little dour. So uh, well, we're Bill, trying to be lighter. <laughs> what do you mean? I talked about joy. <laughs> I, I have not talked about joy, on. but then you talked about a cloud over your head. It doesn't move. So <laughs> uh, Bill, um, help me. Uh, <laughs> Help me bring this to a somewhat more positive um, wrap-up. The positive thing, Mira, is that we're all talking to each other. Yeah. Really. Really, you know, the positive thinking, thing is that we're, we're connected as human beings to each other in a time. Let's not pretend it's not a time of darkness. That doesn't need, I don't think we need to pretend that doesn't exist while still being like, there's almost exhaustion that we are having this conversation together and I hope somebody finds it interesting to be a fly on the wall and, and listen and, you know, there's some beauty in our history, all of us, Mira as well, like part, we are all part of the same history. So the fact that we are here together still caring about what we do, I think is, is really as, is beautiful like Rachel McAdams internally in married life. Like there's something beautiful about this. Um, I agree. And it's actually, some, I mean, I find this as, as difficult as it is, and it's very difficult, I also find it extremely interesting. And I also find that uh, the human spirit is inspiring to me because it's so resilient and it's so innovative. Um, yes. And uh, that is, I find that inspiring. I just want to throw something, I think, to Bill or some, one of you, and uh, Bill, I have the feeling, I wonder if couples, actors, I mean, a man and a woman, or a man and a man, a woman, woman who are married couples, if they will have the best uh, or the first roles because they can kiss, they can touch, and, and there's no worry there. So, mm -hmm. just throwing that as a <laughs> casting, good casting opportunities for couples. Mm. Um, yeah, I think uh, what Oren said, nobody knows. Yeah. No, you know, we're, we're just facing a lot of questions, but uh, I think Ira you know, made a point that I always like to make in, in these conversations, which is uh, we're incredibly lucky uh, and we're incredibly grateful. Uh, and, you know, just to be able to, you know, work uh, in a situation that uh, are, are things that we can do remotely, uh, to be able to have these conversations remotely, to be able to, you know, engage in work that is meaningful to us and satisfying and is, you know, about uh, trying to illuminate, you know, some truths about uh, the experiences that we've all had as, as people. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people who are not in our situation right now. And, you know, they're first and foremost on our minds and uh, how to, you know, help people and, and be of service, uh, I think is on all of our minds. Uh, and, you know, content uh, is not going to go away. The need to tell stories is the, one of the oldest uh, attributes of Homo sapiens. It's the essential way that we're, we were able to, uh, as a species, uh, you know, start to socialize and live in groups. And, you know, now they say the first cave paintings are 75,000 years old or something. So, you know, it's just uh, inimical to our uh, essence that, you know, we're going to try to make sense out of the meaning of our experience and 
uh, you know, bring those stories to other people and that will go on. It'll continue, you know, whether it's on a digital set or a, a location, you know, whether it's a married couple, you know, kissing each other, whatever it is, uh, you know, I, I do feel like, you know, we're, we're fantastic at kind of problem solving and adjusting and you just have to, I mean, you know, the, the only constant in our business and our life is change, you know, so we, we've got to adapt. There's a new reality. It, it is the dark reality. Uh, you know, certainly politically, it's the darkest time I could ever imagine. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're all going to put our hearts and energy into, you know, being positive and trying to foster uh, <clears throat> the ability to tell these stories. Well, um, I think it's a good way to wrap this, um, mm -hmm. that um, we will find ways to tell the sto our stories, or tell um, human stories. And um, I know that you're all very creative and um, I can't wait to see what you will bring once um, you can. And, um, and we will bring it to Woodstock. Please. Yeah. <laughs> You, 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 this is, uh, I mean, I can hold you to that now, right? <laughs> you said it here first. Okay. Um, Michael Taylor is, is uh, your editor. Uh, I write saying that the wonderful conversation, excited uh, to see you all. And uh, Linda Hansen, who is also a wonderful uh, film person, also thank you. And she said she was uh, touched and uplifted. And I'm really happy about that. And, um, because that's what I, I really do want these conversations to be positive and uplifting because we do go through a very difficult time and we want to figure out how to uh, make the best, uh, how to make a difficult situation work uh, better. I mean, you know what I mean, lemonading, I mean, lemons into lemonade. Um, Some people find Bergman very uplifting. <laughs> I love Bergman. <laughs> it's I don't. By the way, but, oh, I would much more done at the time. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you all, Bill and Oren and Ira. It was thank really you. great seeing you. Thank you. Really Thanks great. for having us. Um, Thanks so much. Um, and um, good luck with what, what you're doing and stay in touch. We'll talk again. And send me your scripts, thank guys. You. I'm, I'm counting on it. <laughs> Take good care. Good night, everyone. Thank you for Bye. joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.